something that you engage with deeply and have deep knowledge of. And again, it's something that you couldn't fake. You would have to know about horses and horse racing to write about it the way that you did. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I do agree, like, it, like in regards to landscape. I mean, you've got to be in love with it. If you're not in love with it, then, um, then you, you don't think about it as much or it's the same way with with horse racing. I was in I've been in love with horse racing since uh, for 20 years maybe. Like really in love with it. I fell in love with this woman jockey and I used to follow her around and <laughs> I would try to make friends with all these trainers and it took me years. It took me 10 years to make friends with this the legendary handicapper. It, it our track is the worst track of all time. Okay. It's a like a, a borderline like amateur track. Yeah, it's one of the worst tracks, sad to say. <laughs> um, but the the great the great handicapper there it took me ten years to get the guts up to meet him. <laughs> and my girlfriend's a baker, and she made all these cookies, and I for him. And so I bring it to him, and because he and I would sit in this one area, and no one else would be there. So I brought him these cookies, and he he pulls his shirt up. And he just had a quadruple bypass surgery and goes, what are you trying to kill me, man? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but then he liked me after that, you know? <laughs> so I, I was in love with it. And then the more I fell in love with it, um, the more I learned about it, you know, and you learn about all the horses breaking down, especially at little tracks and, and how hand to mouth uh, these trainers are. They would race a horse every two weeks and you're like, well, you, everybody knows you should let him lay him off and he hasn't been running well. I mean, I'm not a very good handicapper at all, but, but I know those little things. And then so you start asking and you go, well, that guy's broke. And the reason he uh, races his horse so much is because he's broke. And, and Del Montgomery, the trainer in the, in, in, in the novel, is just kind of a combination of four or five guys um, of trainers. And, and actually the, the girl jockey who I be, actually became friends with, um, uh, she said she worked for that guy. She goes, how'd you know that guy? Because she edited the book and the horse racing stuff. So I guess just out of pure love for, for horse racing is, is why I started writing it mm -hmm. and being conflicted with it. And then I bought an old, you know, a $500 uh, ex-Portland Meadows racehorse and, um, and have him in my house and he, he, he's crazy as hell. <laughs> and it's taken my girlfriend like 10 years to get him. Not 10 years, I guess we have like six years to get him straight, at least a little bit. And, um, and so, so that's why I wrote Lean on Pete, because I was ashamed of myself for, for liking something that, that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. so I'd sit at the track, and I wrote a lot at the track. And so I'd sit there, and I'd hate myself for it, you know? But I'd go, but geez, I'll just go tomorrow. And I won on that <laughs> last one, and there's something really fun about gambling. But when you start learning how beat up the jockeys get and, and, and the horses get, um, I, I struggled with it, and, and I, I think I was struggling with the kid. And, and, and my own childhood, re really, I think, too, and the two kind of interconnected. Mm. And so that's why I wrote that book. Well, that was what I was going to ask you both, was the correlation between the, the use of creatures in your books, the farming of fish and the sort of forced breeding and forced farming, and then the, the use and abuse of the horses in your book and the fact that they're being, well, they're used, they're machines. They're not being treated like pets or, or feeling things. They're being used as machines to make money. And um, and then the correlation between that and the treatment of the children who absorb whatever pain is in their parents and who drive onward and onward without really being supported in the way that they need to be. And whether that was a conscious thing for either of you, or maybe you first. I mean, your book is very, very personal about the relationship between a, a father and a child, and I know it draws very much on your own life. And I wondered what you, what you felt about that, the, the coalition between the sort of natural world and then the parenting and the development of a child through bad parenting or, or flawed parenting? When I wrote it, I didn't have any ideas about what I would do. And it, it was a big mess for about 10 years trying to write the book. Um, so I didn't have any clear sort of uh, objectives or, or how I would use the material. Uh, but I knew that I wanted to write about my father and that it was an, an important story. For three years after his suicide, I told everyone that he had uh, died of cancer because I was really ashamed of, of what he had done. And so uh, when I did start writing, uh, for the first three or four years, there was just too much emotion on the first page and I had to throw everything away. And what I had to learn was how to tell the story indirectly and with a greater emotional distance. And uh, 
partly that was from reading other writers that I like Marilyn Robinson's novel Housekeeping, for instance, Elizabeth Bishop's poetry. They both helped for that first story that I, that I read uh, tonight. Uh, and there's a strange relationship between the true material, uh, the true story, and the fiction. Uh, most of the book is a short novel uh, titled Suquan Island, uh, set in an island that's about 50 miles from Ketchikan. And my, um, I grew up in Alaska, but my parents separated, and then I lived in California, and he was still in Alaska. And he asked me to come spend a year with him, and I said no. And then two weeks later, he killed himself. So I felt really guilty for a long time afterward and wondered if I had said yes, if he would still be alive. So the novel is really the boy saying yes. It's a kind of fulfillment of, out of that guilt uh, for me. And that, that was the relationship that the fiction had to the, to the true story. Um, and then the island that they're on, Suquan Island, is a place I've never been to. I've never seen Suquan Island because I wanted it to be a landscape of imagination where nothing would be incidental just because it was that way in my real life. The, the shape of the, of the bay and, and the point and the, the hikes they go on and everything about the place would be a reflection of who they are, and especially the father. The forest would be a, a reflection of his interior life. Um, but it's 50 miles away from Ketchikan where I grew up, so it was the rainforest I knew really well. So it was something both familiar and emotionally powerful for me, but uh, set on a new stage where anything could happen, it could surprise me. And there was a huge surprise that happens halfway through that novella that I didn't see coming until I was writing that sentence. And it changed everything. And, and I, I really didn't see it uh, coming. So that's what I love uh, fiction for, is how it can come to life like that and, and rework uh, the real story. So it, in this book, I basically was taking what was ugliest in my life and trying to have it transform into something else. And is that the case for you with Charlie, who's the protagonist of Lean on Pete? I felt as if the, the use of the horses did correlate somewhat to this child who is being driven by other people, who is taking on other people's burdens and other people's ambitions and doesn't have a voice of his own and falls in love with this creature because it doesn't talk back to him. It doesn't tell him to do anything. It is just his friend. What was the relationship for you between the character and his circumstances? I mean, I, I started writing the book, I think, uh, I was having, I mean, honestly, I guess I was having a hard time figuring out reasons to get out of bed, you know? And, uh, um, and I'm really good at figuring, like playing with my mind to get me motivated and stuff. And I was having a really hard time. And I, I figured, well, I'd be around this kid who, who navigates darkness really, really well. And he, he comes across all the pitfalls and the darker sides of humanity. But, but, um, but he's, he can figure it out well enough to escape most of the time, but he falls in love with someone that is more fucked, basically, than he is, you know? I mean, this, this horse is, uh, is a losing race horse at, a, at the worst track around, and ho horses uh, don't have anywhere to go down from there. Usually, uh, if you can find someone to take them, um, in this economy, it's really hard to unload bad race horses, and they have illegalized uh, slaughtering horses in the U.S., so they ship them down to Mexico, which in itself is just like that, the idea of, of a bunch of horses in the back of a trailer mm -hmm. sent to a place with no regulations. Uh, so I think the kid fall, feels like finally maybe he has enough power uh, to help somebody because he's never had any power. I mean, so, so I wrote a, about saving one horse attempting in my heart. That's what I was trying to do. Um, I've always been really hard on my fathers and on in my book, so I, I usually don't, I, I made a pact with myself when I was 20, I would never write about fathers. But you know, Jesus, I write a lot of stories, <laughs> and I can't stop thinking about my father, you know? Um, but I, I, I go, well, I want somebody, if I ever get my books out there, I want them to go, man, that guy never writes about fathers. <laughs> so now I write about fathers, but I didn't shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I did, but I kinda, I'd shoot him, shoot him pretty rough. I still haven't grown up, I guess, enough to, <laughs> to, to analyze it. I still, like, like my girlfriend goes, well, what stories are you working on? And I was working on this series of stories, and I go, oh, I just wrote a great one where I found my dad in this bar, and I just beat him nearly to death. <laughs> and, and she's like, Jesus, you're, you're so screwed up, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, but it was fun. It was so much fun. And, and I, haven't, I still haven't grown up enough to, to, like, step back and figure it out. I just still have that, like, I get fired up. Maybe that's writers, though. Arrested Development creates books. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah.